I'm a material scientist and a chemist, and uh, it to and I want to you to uh, you know, to to discuss with me things in from a design perspective because as a chemist I'm a molecular designer and I'm a conceptual designer, but I need partners in the design community which just do not only want to beautify things, but really want to have power. Yeah. That we need to look how we can maintain quality and how can we do innovation and and how can we use the 40 years of blame and shame now for quality and innovation. So everybody says, oh, we now re reduced our carbon footprint by 20%. Yeah. So it's all guilt stuff. It says we are 100% evil, then we are 90% evil, and the goal is zero. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to be zero? Yeah. So. Yeah, but, but even a city like Chicago wants to be climate neutral. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds good, yeah, and I read it everywhere, but no, no tree is climate neutral. So we want to be more stupid than a tree. A tree is always climate positive. So we are here in, yeah, at a place where definitely people come together and the spirit of, of Neocon is really amazing. Yeah, how positive and nice and friendly people actually are with that. And, and on the other side, they try to be efficient and think from a life cycle. You ever read about life cycle? But you, did you ever see a life cycle of a PET bottle? How sick? Did you ever see life in a PET bottle? Yeah. And so traditionally, we think from cradle to grave, and that means that the whole planet will become a graveyard. Yeah. And when we try to minimize this a little bit, it will be just a little later. Yeah. But it doesn't change this. Even if we slow down the speed of destruction for ecological systems, we reach the opposite. Because when you have a slow collapse, the collapse, the niches die as well. When you have a quick collapse, the system can recover from the niches. And sure, we have massive quality problems. You know, so there are more than uh, 6 million tons of plastic going into the oceans. You know, we have areas in the northern Pacific where the plastic concentration is, is up to 40 times higher than the plankton concentration. So here, <laughs> Copenhagen is the most ambitious one. They want to be carbon neutral in 2025. But did you ever see a carbon neutral tree? Yeah. So low carbon economy. <laughs> How nice. Yeah. It tells you, please don't exist. Here, you said, Toyota says our aim is zero emission. And to show a tree as zero emissions, you know, a tree makes oxygen. This is an emission. The, the highest in Europe is a passive house. We seal our houses and try to save energy with it. Yeah. So, but, but this building, uh, this tree cleans the air. This tree cleans water. This tree is habitat for 200 other species as a minimum. This tree makes soil. But this is where we are. We try to make things efficient. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was a child, a cow was producing 5,000 liters of milk a year. And I thought this was a lot. Today in the Netherlands, we have 11,000 liters. Should we squeeze another thousand liter out of the poor cow, yeah, make it more efficient? Yeah. Or should we generate a sheep with an extra pair of legs that we have 50% more? Yeah. The same, if you, if you uh, drink champagne, you can reduce your carbon footprint against Prosecco. Or if you, if you reduce, don't drink uh, uh, sparkling water, but still water, it's uh, seven liters of carbon dioxide. So you can really do something. Yeah. But this is where we are. It's called smart cities, you know, nachhaltig, for example, in Germany, efficient. You know. So that's why we feel so terrible. You said, oh, it's better we don't build a house at all. You know. It's better we are not the architects. You know. Better we minimize our footprint. You can do something you know, in, in, when you want to minimize your carbon footprint. For example, when you can't cut your hair shorter, it saves 5,000 liters of water. You, know. you can really do something to be less bad. You know. But, but we think it's environmental protection when we just destroy a little less. Yeah. So, so if you would speak up and say, look, in 2020, we want to see that the indoor air quality in a building is, re is better than outside air. Yeah. You would change so much in innovation. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you design it for indoor use? Yeah. Design from, designed for indoor use. Yeah. I can show you, it's the first upholstery bed which is designed for indoor use. Yeah. Normally, when you buy a mattress, IKEA, etc., it says, uh, "Please keep it at open air for 48 hours." Do you think it doesn't stink after 48 hours? Yeah. Here we have wallpapers, for example. What a nightmare! They're covered with soft PVC, and 
they really destroy fertility. And I did a, a, a study in 1984 about PVC plasticizers, yeah, phthalates, yeah. and I showed that it leads to dramatic loss of fertility. I said we need to stop this. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of things we make things free of. Yeah. Uh, but they said these brake pads look a little bit like this remote control. These are free of asbestos. I think, oh great, free of asbestos. But the replacement is antimony sulfate, which is a much stronger carcinogen. <laughs> I invite you for dinner and say it's free of chicken. It doesn't really help you so much. Yeah. So that's why we need to define what is in there. That makes design so important. This is where we are. We, we try to make our customer our enemies. Please don't buy my stuff. Yeah. Because then you can minimize your footprint. You can do a lot to, to, to minimize your footprint. Definitely. Like, yeah, if you, for example, take an airplane yeah, from Chicago to Frankfurt and everybody empty his digestion system with a little tablet. Yeah. So just, yeah, we have to be there for security reasons two hours earlier. And everybody takes a little tablet. You can reduce your weight so much that it saves five tons of kerosene for the airplane. Yeah, five tons. Yeah, and and if people fly shopping, yeah, they could fly naked. It would save another two tons of kerosene. Yeah, so there's a lot you can do to minimize your footprint. So, but this is why it's not about efficiency. It's not using the same stuff. It's saying, hey, look, it's, it, let's say, talk about effectiveness. Yeah? So, what is the right thing to do? Not just uh, yeah, optimizing existing stuff. It makes sense to minimize your footprint uh, for oil and coal, but where's the where's our beneficial footprint? Yeah. So why don't we make a big footprint, but make it a wetland, a beneficial footprint? And this is definitely an impact uh, which we need to reduce on a negative side. But where's our positive impact? Yeah. In the Netherlands, people easily understand the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. Yeah. Think about falling in love with somebody efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. Think about Mozart being efficient. Yeah. Yeah. It would be one tone, all operas in one tone. Okay, some husbands might like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they have to join for the opera. Uh, but on the other side, uh, everything that is in life is not efficient. Yeah. Think about a nice coffee, yeah. a nice conversation. Uh, taking care of children efficiently. Now the question is, think about a lipstick, for example. And a woman eats about 6.3 kilograms of lipstick during her lifetime. Yeah. Uh, it's not efficient, but it can tell you very effective. Yeah. Let's be beneficial. And we don't need to be perfect. We can say, look, this is where we are, and this is where we want to be. Isn't it amazing? We want to be good for economy. We want to be good for society, but when it comes to environment, the highest is no impact. Yeah. But why don't we have a beneficial impact? Yeah. So this is why it's not about optimizing existing stuff to say, but to say what is the right thing to do. Yeah. We need to distinguish between two different systems. Yeah. For example, stuff which gets consumed, like food, like shoe salts, like detergents, like brake pads, like tires, need to be designed to go into biological systems. And when you make these things more efficient, you make the wrong things perfect. Like the tire dust is now really amazingly dangerous because the tires last much longer. Yeah, than 30 years ago, they last twice as long. Now we inhale the dust and we lose twice, up to three times more of our lifespan by inhaling fine dust than we lose by drinking too much alcohol. Yeah. So, and for alcohol, you can try it out till the third class. You can decide whether you want to drink or not. Yeah, or some people don't drink alcohol at all, but you can decide about it. Yeah. But for fine dust, you cannot decide about it. Yeah. And so the technical cycles, you don't consume a washing machine, you don't consume a TV set, you only use it as a service. Now we have the first washing machine with Bosch Siemens on the market, which you just sell 3000 times of washing. Yeah. Um, so then you can use far better materials, not the cheapest ones. Sure, it is not that you make everything easily compostable because you'd use it in the biosphere for different areas and you use it in technosphere. So it's not a really circular economy at all because you don't want to come back as a rabbit forever. Yeah? So you want to learn from it. That's why it's about upcycling, not about recycling. Yeah? And sure, it is that we need to systematically communicate environmental health about the things. Yeah? In environmental health statement allows it, but it, it's more than this product declaration thing, because we distinguish between the biosphere and the technosphere.
Water, for example, is amazingly toxic when you're over the Atlantic. Yeah? But when you are in desert, yeah, you need it. Yeah? So it depends on the exposure. Yeah? PVC can be extremely problematic when it's used, for example, in making uh, name tags for yeah, this, this event here. This is why we need to look for things and say, hey, look, uh, where can we use the materials in the right way? And we need to look at that. And if you, in, in a later discussion, I would like to come back on that. But you see, it's a very profound work because it takes all the stuff positively. Yeah. When I invite you for dinner and I say it's free of chicken, it doesn't help you, but I take, give you the recipe. So this environmental health statement gives you the recipe of what it is. And it openly communicates where we have difficulties. Yeah? That, hey, wait a minute, we still have, don't have the right pigment here. Yeah? We want to get this out here. Yeah? Because it allows the young scientists to find innovation opportunities. So, so it's not just a statement in line with whatever. No, it really celebrates innovation opportunities and new designs. And sure, it means that we look at the whole use scenario, but we don't look at the life cycle. We look, you'd look at the use period here, because we need defined, defined use periods for the getting the material back. But I can tell you the strongest carcinogens are natural chemicals by far. The most toxic chemicals are natural chemicals as well. Yeah. But what we can learn from nature, nature is not stupid. They don't, nature doesn't make chemicals which accumulate in breast milk and muscles milk, for example. But so we can really do something to be less bad. But what we can learn from nature, nature doesn't make chemicals. So if you would say, look, in 2020, we don't want to use stuff which accumulates in breast milk. You would do so much more for this planet than just making a shape a little differently or choosing one chemical against another one. Yeah, so look at, at these general parameters to say, look, we, indoor air quality uh, contamination in biological systems. And so this is why we need to look systematically and say, okay, here is what needs to be optimized here. Yeah? And this is what we don't know. But the first thing is really we need, we take the European precautionary principle. Please understand this. So when we say it's a carcinogen, we don't say it's a carcinogen and we will sue you for that. But we say we are concerned that this is a carcinogen. Yeah. So this is why it is really about systematically looking at the production process at the energy side, it's the water stewardship and all different types of things. And we include other labels and areas as well in it. We look systematically, yeah, we take the cradle to cradle certification for the environmental health statement because we need to do so because there are a lot of stuff which we then lose as an opportunity. Silicons, for example, are amazingly dangerous, but only half of them. Now you see on shampoos free of silicons. Yeah? But with some of these silicons make a coating for coral reefs. So you really need to get them out. That's why this environmental health statement is so important because we need to differentiate between the different substances and different applications. There are areas where we could use PVC yeah, when we look systematically at the whole industry. So first of all, when I did in, in this article in 1984, exactly 30 years ago, yeah, it's, yeah, there was uh, definitely uh, a lot of concern. First is the monomer vinyl chloride, yeah, which is a proven carcinogen. Yeah. So at that time, and still a lot of Chinese stuff has a lot of vinyl chloride in it, which is off-gassing. Yeah. So, and as well, we need to have safe labor conditions. When you look today at the vinyl industry here in this country, it's, the work conditions are safe. Yeah. So that has been fixed. Yeah. Then there are stabilizers being used, like lead and cadmium. Yeah. The, in the new PVC, there is no lead and cadmium in the United States anymore. But what do companies do? They take the old PVC products and put it in the new ones. So they dilute all the lead and cadmium in new products. So, but basically it has been solved. You know, in you know, Tarket, there is no lead and cadmium being used in there. Yeah. So. So one after the other, one thing was the emissions of, car, of vinyl products, VOCs. Yeah. There are legal concerns about it, but the company Tarket and others said, we don't care about legal stuff, we take the best. We want to make sure that the stuff is designed for being used in buildings. So for Tarket, this has been solved as well. So 
so we can go over that, but still, when you have the, the PVC and you lose it, for example, in a, in a, a waste landfill, the, the vinyl is, uh, the PVC is depolarized into vinyl chloride. So you get, you, know, you get vinyl chloride in the groundwater. And, and when you burn it, you, know, you have all mixed types of chemicals from that. So we, we, because why do we need PVC in a very strange way? PVC was one of the first waste management things, which has been done in history. 101 years ago, the patent was filed uh, for PVC. Uh, it was a French invention originally, and it was filed uh, uh, as a, but when you read why it was produced, it was mostly before the First World War that the scientists were concerned about the use of chlorine in chemical weapons. Because they said, if we have so much chlorine around us, we need to do something with it. We need to put it into a product where it makes sense, because otherwise we will make chemical weapons everywhere. And sure, it was a little late for the First World War, as you know, still millions of people died and suffered from you know, chlorine as a chemical weapon, uh, because it was exactly be one year before the First World War started in that, but they saw it coming. Yeah. And, and with that, uh, the reason why we have such, such a surplus of chlorine is the need of sodium hydroxide to neutralize chemicals, caustic soda. Yeah. And, and, why do we do so? Where do we get it? We get it from salt. Yeah. So, it's salt. Salt is sodium chloride. Yeah. And if you want to get sodium hydroxide, we need to split with by electrolysis sodium chloride and uh, sodium into sodium hydroxide here and in chlorine plus hydrogen. And then we have all this so chlorine chlorine left left. We have 40 million tons of production capacity. And, yeah, and then, sure, we have the stabilizers. Deoctylphthalate, for example, is one of the most problematic ones. Yeah, clear endocrine disrupting. And this has been solved now as well by Telcat, but not for, by the whole industry. So I'm sorry to make it so complex, but if it's not, if you only make it black and white and say, oh, PVC is good or bad, so it's like if you say water is good or bad, yes, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So this is why the environmental health statement is so important, that you really say, when PVC is not managed properly, you need to phase it out. Yeah. But if you just stop it here, we will import Chinese PVC, and then we get all the problems back here. Yeah. And then we start from zero with it. Doesn't help us as well. Yeah. So, and as well, if we discredit the PVC completely as a designer, yeah, then the price gets so low that the companies who do the PVC cannot change anymore because they don't have the vitality to earn the money with it. Yeah. That's why it's critical and why you as designers are key in that. We now can take the class half full, not half empty, yeah? and we can do innovation. That's why Cradle to Cradle becomes an innovation engine, and it celebrates designers. So if you want to be a designer, not a beautifier, just yeah, then you are in the center of the whole process for that. And sure, we can do new things, we make, make plant-based materials stronger. We can make buildings which actively clean air instead of growing corn, which is a crime to do so because we steal food. We can use the facades of buildings and it's 80 times more productive to grow algae. The protein is much more healthy than beef. Yeah. So if we would base a diet on, on, on uh, microorganisms, so making pro-microbial things, not antimicrobial ones, if we would base our diet on algae, on mushrooms, we could easily feed much healthier 50 billion people on this planet. The biomass of ants is about four times bigger than humans, and they are not an environmental problem because they are beneficial, not less bad. You can do something to minimize your carbon footprint in a building. If you take the elevator, it takes five times less energy than if you take the stairs. You know, because taking the stairs you know, makes, needs much, much more calories than taking the elevator. If you want to minimize your footprint by five times, you know, take the elevator. And by the way, then you die a little earlier, you can minimize your footprint even more. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities. So this is why it's about innovation, yeah, quality. And then we don't need to steal agricultural land. We can use the facades for growing algae, 80 times more productive. When we grow corn, we lose between 11 and 30 tons of soil.
And they said as well, we don't uh, get out of PVC just to let the others do the dirty stuff. No, we said, let's find a management for PVC, which makes sense to get enough sodium hydroxide and not, not have the PVC from Malaysia when it stinks and, and pollutes all the people. It's our responsibility when we are in PVC for that, not just to get away. So this is why it is about looking at algae for polymers, for example, and it's so productive and so healthy to do so. And sure, we can make sometimes wooden houses just to, as exercises for healthy indoor air quality. In Europe, people now get subsidies to burn wood as a renewable resource, which could, destroys all the pocket poles and uh, other kitchen manufacturers from Germany, all the famous ones, because the particle boards yeah, cannot, they cannot afford the, the wood anymore because it's so much more profitable to burn wood. This is what I call ecologism. Yeah? It doesn't help the ecology, it only keeps us busy. When you would first make furniture and building materials, then make uh, wood chips and particle boards for that and pulp and paper then, and then you would use the pulp and paper and recycle the stuff and then burn it, you would have the same caloric value, but you generate 40 times more jobs. So there are not these simple quick fix things. Yeah, we need to allow complexity, otherwise we cannot come up with real solutions. There's cradle to cradle islands, which might be interesting. Long Island, for example, New York is one of the cradle to cradle islands as well, or Taiwan is as well, where we can try out all different types of things. And in each building, we put in three big methods and five to 10 gimmicks, yeah, things which make people smile, but as well big messages. And if you say, hey, we want to be partners for tech kit to get the material back, yeah, then it would be a big story, not just a little thing. Yeah. And this is where you can do so. So let's be beneficial and we don't need to be perfect. We can say, look, this is where we are and this is where we want to be. And this is why Telcat is so interesting because they have a long-term strategy. It's not a little green washing here and there. No, it's saying this is where we want to be. In 2020, in 25, depending on you, yeah, because when you buy products, yeah, you help them to change. The more you buy, the quicker they can change. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? We want to be good for economy. We want to be good for society, but when it comes to environment, the highest is no impact. Yeah. But why don't we have a beneficial impact? Yeah. And this is why it's a triple top line, not a triple bottom line. Yeah. So this is why it's not about optimizing existing stuff to say, but to say what is the right thing to do. Yeah. And this is effectiveness. This is why it's a cultural thing. First, not a circular economy thing, because this is a journey, you know, that it needs solidarity, it needs support, it needs loyalty, and it needs a real community building. And you can be a partner in this community. Thank you very much.